And good morning. How's everyone doing today? Uh, welcome back to Psychology 241. It is your Professor Dr. Roddenberry uh, streaming to you live from the fabulous Willow Springs, North Carolina. Back home again. Depression has set in. Uh, unfortunately, here I am grounded. Uh, but life goes on. One can only take so much cultural education in one's life. Um, but, you know, that's cool. I hope everybody's doing well today. Seems like we have Nicole. Ireland was it was awesome. I really love the open, unpretentious spirit of the Irish people. They love to get loud and rowdy. You know, um, if the music's moving them, they're dancing and they're singing and they're having a great time. And I just really felt... Uh, uh, yeah, they, they, they were they were a, a, a great culture. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rosemary. Uh, it's good to be home. Uh, fantastic. Ryan Wheeler, good to see you. I hope you're doing well. Um, we are in week seven now, chapter seven. Rosemary, I swear to God, I'm going to get chapter eight up uh, by the end of the day. It is my mission in life to get it up before I see you again. Um, so I will have that. So we are in chapter seven. Next week will be chapter eight. And uh, then we will have our second exam. So if, keep in mind, our second midterm is coming up next weekend. Not this weekend, but next weekend. I just want to give you a heads up. Uh, there will be a... Uh, there will be a review session, of course, and there will be a review sheet. Um, so next Friday, we'll have the review, the exam review. So we'll do all the stuff that you, you need to have done so you're prepared for that exam. Um, yeah, the hospitality is definitely, they were a very hospitable and friendly group of people. I would agree with that. So let's see, that's coming up in two weeks. Uh, this Wednesday night at 6 p.m., uh, we are going to be talking, uh, we are going to be having our uh, next webinar. So I hope everybody comes to the to uh, the webinar. Still haven't decided exactly which direction I'm going to go, but I do hope to see everybody at 6 p.m. on Wednesday. You know, as always, uh, because you're such great, uh, a great group of people, the discussion will be fabulous and interesting and you'll have a good time. So that'll be this Wednesday. And then, of course, we have the discussion board, the first discussion board activity in Chapter 7 quiz. Um, but we are almost halfway into this semester, so congratulations, everybody. Uh, the participation performance has really been really good, and I have absolutely no complaints about what anybody is doing. So with further ado, let's rock on into Chapter 7, Physical and Cognitive Development in Early Childhood. If you remember the first three weeks, we did physical development in infancy. We did cognitive development in infancy. Last week, we did socio-emotional uh, development in infancy. So we're going to go back and do the same thing for the next period of development, uh, right? Uh, which is going to be early childhood. So from the toddler years two till probably around four or five, what we'll call the preschool years uh, when you're toddler to preschooler-ish. Now, um, what we're going to do, instead of talking about physical one week and cognitive one week, uh, the, the most important changes, the most profound changes happen during infancy. And so that's why they cover each area of development in one whole chapter during these first, uh, uh, first period of development. But as we get a little older, the differences are going to be less profound. And so we're going to start clumping uh, these these areas together. So today we're this week we're going to talk about physical and cognitive development in early childhood. We're going to put those two areas of development in and we're going to handle them during this period of development. Just as a reminder, development is lifelong from conception to death. And if you remember our first period of development was prenatal development and we talked about uh, the process of developing the baby and how you could protect the baby from harm. Remember, uh, babies that come through pregnancy healthy are less likely to die during that first year of life uh, with the congenital problems, and that adds to the average lifespan of human beings, right? And then we talked about uh, infant development, and we talked about how you needed to uh, 
watch, use milestone trackers to make sure your child's neurological development, the most profound thing, uh, is going properly uh, during this stage. And that's because we find, because of flexibility, uh, the brain's plasticity, the earlier we find these problems, the better outcomes we can achieve for children. Remember, developmental psychology is not only interested in the length of lifespan, but also the quality of life. So if you can see, what we're doing is we're building this model up of what we know is allows people to develop uh, without dying, you know, to avoid the pitfalls of death and also to have the highest quality of life. Remember, over the whole semester, I'm going to try to convince you that the reason you need to know about developmental psychology is because it allows you to uh, live your best life and also to help your children and loved ones live their best life. Right. So we're going to talk about the most common causes of death during this period, uh, early childhood, the pattern of neurological, physical and language development that occurs during this stage. We're going to talk about eating and sleeping during this stage. And we're going to talk about daycares and uh, the value of uh, the Head Start programs. We've got a lot to cover. OK, orient ourselves from number one. We're now in the third period, early childhood, three to five years, whatever. Uh, from the time your kid is toddling around pretty good on their feet and speaking pretty well until they go to school. And we're talking about cognitive and biological development, right? <clears throat> All right. So welcome to early childhood, right? So uh, what we've got here are just some, some basic numbers about uh, children and, uh, and the things you need to worry about. Right, lawn darts. <laughs> Freaking, can you believe those things existed, man? These huge metal three-pound um, metal-pointed objects that they sold in toy stores, folks. And you could take these, and you, the idea was you could throw them and try to hit, land them in those circles. Exactly we did. And you could kill another kid with them. They were the most dangerous toy, but they were completely legal in the 70s, uh, maybe I guess and even uh, into the 80s when you were uh, 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 growing up, uh, Rosemary. And those things were killers. Why, do, why are they now illegal? Why do they not exist anymore? Because if you look down at the very bottom of this chart, you see the leading causes of death in early childhood. Yeah, right. Uh, you will see that unintentional injuries, accidents, accidents, accidents are the most common killer of children during early childhood. Actually, if you look, accidents are going to be the most likely cause of death until you reach your mid 40s. That, my friends, is why we wear seat belts. That, my friends, is why we put helmets on our kids when they ride bicycles. That's why we worry about youth football and lawn darts and all of these things. Now, in terms of total number of deaths, I mean, look at uh, for 65 and older, uh, half a million people die every year with uh, heart from heart attacks and heart disease. Well, if you look at these, all these accidents in these other age groups, they still don't even come close to adding up to 519,000 deaths, all right? This is true. So the absolute number of deaths isn't as large, right? So that, you know, we definitely need to work on heart, heart disease more. But what you need to know is when we're raising children, one of the things that we need to be aware of are that if there are few things that are going to kill our children, it is going to be accidents. So that's sort of, and you have children who are rambunctious. They just have started walking around on their feet. Their, their sense, their intelligence, their common sense is not caught up to their physical abilities at this point. So it's kind of important that we need to make sure that we don't put our children in situations where they can uh, uh, hurt themselves. Now, if you look at this chart over here, what it's going to show you is sort of uh, the difference, uh, the distributions of, of men and women at the time of their death. And what you're going to uh, what you probably already know is that women on average have a longer lifespan than do men. That means fewer of them die younger in life than do men. And if you look throughout uh, throughout the entire lifespan, starting from the time people are like 10, 15 years old, do you see the blue line is always higher for uh, representing more men dying at each age group 
than women all the way until their 80s. So men are much more likely to die during this age. Now, why is this? Uh, uh, you know, is it testosterone uh, that drives violence, that drives aggressive behavior, that drives crazy driving, uh, right? So you might ask yourself, what are the factors that cause men to die uh, earlier in life than women. And if you look at these distributions, it's not a big difference, but it shows you that moderately throughout life, men are more likely to die. Now, uh, actually more men are born than women on average. I think it's like 51 to 50, if you look at the long odds. So there's a couple more men uh, that are born every year than are females. And uh, as men die off, these numbers sort of keeps us in a 50-50 uh, balance of males to females in the species. But what I want you to know is that accidents are uh, the most important thing uh, to think about. The child car seats, the seat belts, um, the, the careful with the toys, keeping the poisons away. And you know, no matter what you feel about handguns, positive or negative, if you're going to have them, you probably already know that you have to store them in a safe place so that your children can't accidentally hurt themselves with these. Now, all right, all right, early childhood, physical growth, the time between when your child learns to walk and talk and when they start their formal schooling, right? So let's sort of think about it as that particular period. The average growth is two and a half, that's fine. The average growth is two and a half inches and five to 10 pounds per year during early childhood from three to about five. Now, growth patterns will vary individually. Some of us uh, were short in first grade and wound up being the tallest kid in class in, in 12th grade. Some of us were the tallest kid in first grade and turned out to be one of the shorter kids and in 10th grade, and then there were people like me that were the shortest in first grade and the shortest in 10th grade and the shortest forever. Um, and so the growth patterns do vary individually, but boys tend to be a little bit bigger during this period. Now, uh, because girls have their puberty uh, uh, spurt earlier than boys, what you're going to find is when we get to middle childhood, that's going to flip around and your girls are going to be a little bit bigger than your boys. But at this period, your boys are typically going to be a little bit bigger during, <laughs> during uh, this period, right? I am jealous, doggone it, Ronnie, and that's why I wear my cowboy boots as often as possible. Those heels give me two more inches, and when you're my height, those two inches really, really matter. Okay, so the two most important contributions to height differences um, are culture, ethnicity, and uh, and nutrition. Uh, so typically, uh, your urban upper middle class uh, firstborns are going to be bigger. Uh, your African Americans are going to be bigger, um, and nutrition. Uh, uh, you know, the availability of resources, which really is going to figure into your uh, your uh, upper middle and uh, 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 first class. You know what I mean? Those wealthier parents are going to have better nutrition. Um, now, uh, some people do have, your book talks about growth hormone deficiency. There are some children that have a genetic disorder that leads to the absence of a growth hormone produced by the pituitary gland, which causes the body to grow. And when we talk about puberty, we're going to uh, talk about this. But uh, your book does introduce it in, in this chapter. If you remember, uh, we did suggest to you that your genes uh, and mutations can affect uh, what we actually talked about, the genetic syndromes that you might have. We talked about uh, inter intersex uh, people who, who, whose sexuality doesn't turn out completely uh, 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 cisgender one way or the other, uh, cisgender, um, and we talked about uh, uh, chromosomal disorders. There, there are definitely problems that relate to the, uh, the genetic instructions that may affect uh, our development, and one of the important parts of our development is the stimulation of the pituitary gland to cause the growth spurt uh, that's going to occur uh, to us in adulthood. And there are some people who don't have this. Now, uh, without this hormone therapy, children with this deficiency will not reach five foot tall. I think typically uh, around five foot is considered uh, below any anywhere below that. And I think uh, typically something um, is a, something is amiss. There's some sort of uh, uh, 
mutation or va variation which causes uh, uh, people not to grow that tall. <coughs> now, um, uh, you can take hormone therapy for this. Um, and of course, uh, your boys, uh, being as it's sort of, uh, there is societal pressure uh, to be tall when you're a fellow dam. Um, <coughs> um, uh, boys are twice as likely to take this hormone uh, therapy. And you know, uh, I hate to say it, but uh, uh, this this little bit of growth is uh, may work to uh, to help somebody's self esteem. Uh, you're not short, you're fun size. I like that, Rosemary. Uh, that joke goes over uh, worse if you're a male. That one just doesn't seem, you, you can't say I'm fun size and get a lot of attention from the ladies. It just don't work that way. Right, Ronique? Tell me I'm lying. Okay, so uh, the brain finishes growing in size. Now, it's going to continue to myelinate. But it's pretty much going to finish its size, its growth, during early childhood. It reaches about 75% of adult volume by three years and 95% uh, by six years. So your brain, by the time you get to kindergarten, uh, your brain is going to be its adult size. Now, if you think about it, you are not your adult height. So I don't know about you folks. I played peewee football, and there's nothing funnier uh, than watching a bunch of seven-year-old or eight-year-old kids out there running around with football helmets on because they look like all football helmets and shoulder pads and they got these teeny little legs coming out from underneath those big helmets um, and it's kind of cute to watch but it's but basically what that's saying is that head is almost adult growth by the time you're six years of age there's going to be very little growth in the brain after three years Really, the change that you're going to start to see in your brain after the first three years is uh, going to be this blooming and pruning that we talked about in chapter four. I think it was physical development. Your brain's architecture is going to become uh, more specialized uh, based on your early experience and stimulation. You're going to see that. And then you're going to see, uh, you're going to continue to see the growth of myelin tissue. Now, a lot of myelination has happened, but your brain still is not fully myelinated and will not fully myelinate until sometime in your early 20s. If you look at this picture right underneath here, this is the cross cut of an axon. The white part in the middle is the axon of a neuron. And then you'll notice around it, that's, there's that brown material. Um, that brown material is the myelin tissue. <clears throat> myelin tissue is just sheets of glial cells that kind of mold together and they build up sheets and they wrap around these axons multiple times and they insulate these axons, okay? And so uh, this is sort of the myelination that's going to uh, continue and it's going to complete. So your hand-eye coordination, <coughs> myelination, the areas that <coughs> in your cerebellum, that control your hand-eye coordination. You're not going to fully myelinate until around four. And one of the things that you're going to see is, uh, um, and they, they don't do this typically, but you can do this experimentally. What you'll see is that increased myelination at the age of three is related to improved cognitive skill. So the speed and quality of this myelination is going to mature the functional abilities of the brain. Now, the most rapid growth um, uh, is that's going to happen from the age from three to six is the frontal lobe, right? Now, if you remember when I was talking about Piaget uh, a couple of weeks ago in cognitive development, the development of symbolic and logical abilities, and uh, uh, those of you who've had children and know that about the terrible twos and, and, and how disorganized three years old, most rapid growth occurs in the frontal lobe. That's the part of your brain that controls your emotions, that does planning and organization, that has logical thinking. And so this part of your brain is going to be coming online last, in a sense, uh, because it's the last part of your brain to, to myelinate. But your growth and the, uh, 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 the, the, neuro, the organizational connections in the myelinations uh, is, is, is going to be here last, but your, your most growth is going to be in the frontal lobe from three to six. Um, and poverty and parenting skills do impact brain development. 
Um, poverty in the fact that uh, families that are under stress can't provide, don't have the time, the ability, the resources, whatnot, to provide this stimulation uh, for their children. And sometimes people um, in, in these situations may have grown up in difficult families of their own where they really haven't had positive parenting skills reinforced in them. And so it's very important during this year's uh, that you provide stimulation for your children. Now, again, this is conversational uh, uh, um, um, stimulation. This is uh, helping children uh, work through and control impulses. You know, people say that you really shouldn't uh, have to uh, control your children because they're just not young enough as if they're naturally going to develop self-control. Self-control is a skill it needs to be stimulated during critical periods too. From two to four years old, you really need to help your child learn to take control of their emotions. You're not being mean to them, but what you need to do is to help them learn the strategies that connect, uh, you know, the functioning in the uh, in the, uh, uh, the 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 frontal lobe area. So parenting skills. Um, are going to affect brain development, especially in the frontal and temporal lobes. So, you know, it's important that we um, <clears throat> that we that we 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 do this. Now, if you look over here on the far left side, I have the synaptic density in different areas of the brain, and what you'll see typically is that the synaptic density for each of these different areas will go all the way up, peak, and then begin uh, decreasing as the brain uh, prunes the unused connections. And what you're going to kind of see is that your frontal lobe tends to peak uh, last. And what they typically, you can think of this peaking uh, and this downward slope as representing your slide towards maturity of that area. And you're going to see that the frontal lobe is a little bit behind the others in terms of peak synaptic density and the inevitable pruning that comes as your brain creates its final architecture. Okay, most preschool children are more active than they will ever be at any period later in the lifespan. Full of energy. Development of fine motor skills abilities still lags behind your gross motor skill abilities, but your kids are going to want to run, jump, kick, uh, climb things, and do all kinds of crazy daredevil type things. Um, and this is just a normal part of your child uh, trying out and practicing those newly learned motor abilities and those that increased coordination ability that's developing during this age. Now, in terms of your fine motor skills, they're going to lag a little bit behind uh, your 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 gross motor skills, and so that's why when you get to kindergarten, they usually give you the fat pencil and they give you the paper with the with the big lines, right? And then you have your high school rule paper. And then when you get to college, you get your college rule paper with the really small lines. And what these different sizes of paper and different pencils represent is the understanding that children, especially during the three, the preschool and first couple years of schooling period, uh, may not have as finely developed fine motor skills as they do gross motor skills. And you know what? Some children who have delays in their fine motor abilities actually will suffer delays when they get to, to kindergarten and first grade. And it's not because they can't intellectually do the work, but maybe they have trouble writing because they're fine motor skills. So a proper school evaluation, we will talk about this later, looks at all of your abilities, not because school is a function of your motor abilities as well as your cognitive and socio-emotional abilities. And impairments in any of those areas can be detrimental to your child's overall performance in school. Now, your fine motor skills are going to develop a little bit slower, so your child does have the pincer grasp, but it's still not going to be great at three years. They're not going to be great with their crayons and their fat pencils. Improved fine motor coordination by four years and um, your kid's going to just have a complete body coordination. They're just going to be running around doing, you know, not clumsy at all, not having any agility problems by the age of five years. OK, uh, your gross motor skills, your kid's going to be able to engage in uh, walking, uh, holding things, 
but your child won't really be good uh, in swinging a baseball bat or kicking a soccer ball, being that great at kicking a soccer ball or playing catch with a football. Actually, maybe kicking a soccer ball, but not something as complex as like catching and playing a coordinated game. Your kids are going to become a little more adventurous as four. Uh, I remember, uh, the attachment anxiety is now going to be long gone, and your kid is going to be ready to adventure, and you're going to have to be the one running them down and stopping them. Remember, accidents are the number one killer of children of these age, so you need to be careful from them. And your kid's going to be doing hair-raising risks and crazy stuff at five. See, mommy, watch me, watch me, mommy, and they're going to jump and do all kinds of crazy things. So you need to be very careful. Remember, accidents are the number one killer of children. Okay. Now, uh, if you'll notice, <coughs> if you'll notice down here, uh, by the way, you see the two pictures. Uh, we got a picture of a three-year-old here on the left, and then we have a picture uh, drawn by a six-year-old here in B. Notice the change in fine motor skills and honestly abil the ability to perceive and contemplate an object mentally and reproduce that on a page. A son, friend's son is five, a nonverbal autistic who's a stimulation seeker. She has to be aware of him constantly, much more so than even normal. Yes, Nicole, we actually, when I worked at the uh, Miracle Baseball, Miracle League Baseball League, we had a kid like that too, and he had to have two hosts with him because he would just run, and you had to have guards at the gates uh, because he would take off out of the ball field and go running into the woods. And uh, he was an autistic, nonverbal child, but I know exactly what you're talking about. Uh, he had that hair-raising, uh, crazy uh, adventurousness, yes. Um, and that's great. You love to see that in a kid, but you also have to sort of control that because it can get them into danger, right? Uh, children may be a little farsighted at this age. Um, and really, uh, again, one of the things we look at when a child is struggling in the first and second grade is uh, their, their visual ability, too. But the ability to focus, move eyes, and pay attention to close objects is going to be present by about the five, of eight, uh, about five or six. So your fine motor skills are going to be getting better. And the reason we start school at five and six, six is actually when school is supposed to start, is because we understand that children's fine motor bill, uh, abilities are matured by this age. Their gross motor skills and their coordination is, 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 uh, is ready for school. And then their gross motor abilities, <coughs> of course, are already there. But their perceptual development, their ability to see. So we've got children whose uh, person, at, and we talk about school readiness, and this is what you have to decide when you have that child whose uh, birthday falls near the deadline of school and you can send them in. So let's say the deadline is October 15th and your child was born the 20th of October. Technically, they should wait till the next year to go to school. And you're trying to decide as a parent, well, what should I do? Should I send that child to school? Well, it's uh, you have to make sure that 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 child is school ready. So how are their fine motor abilities? How are their perceptual, their visual abilities? How are their emotional abilities? You know, and what you're going to find is that your little boys uh, sometimes aren't as emotionally mature uh, as the, uh, <clears throat> and their verbal abilities aren't as well developed as uh, the females at this point. Children, socio-emotional, uh, boys' socio-emotional and verbal skills uh, lag behind the little girls. I mean, you know little boys are more more immature. And so the question that you have to decide as a parent uh, when you're at that cutoff is, is my child's school ready? And it's not just intellectually. It's about their emotions, their fine motor control, their visual ability. It's, it's, it's the whole package is what we need to make sure of before we send our child uh, to school. I have seen parents who've made the mistake by pushing a little boy too early. Um, and I've seen some children that maybe lost a year because their parents were, uh, you know, were afraid and didn't realize that their child was school ready. So uh, as something you parents need to be thinking about, uh, in, you know, in your, in your lives and with your children. All right. Uh, children should be sleeping during the night and probably taking one nap during this age. This is from th at three years old, right? Starting at three years old. Now, this is going to, to drop away. But around three, your child still probably 
uh, taking a nap during the day, and they might definitely should be sleeping through the night. And doctors do recommend 11 to 13 hours of day uh, sleeping. And you know, the deal is if you put your kid to bed uh, sort of at, at nine o'clock at night and let them sleep till in the morning, uh, you know, and then they take one nap during the day, that's going to be that 11 or 13 hours. Now, here's the deal. I have found a ton of parents make this mistake. They let their kids rule the roost. And if the kid doesn't want to go to bed, the parent doesn't make them go to bed. Here's the deal. Learning how to go to bed, going to bed is also a learned skill. A lot of parents think they're being cruel if they enforce a bedtime on their child. You need to enforce a bedtime early on your in your child's life, and you don't have to do it with, in a mean way, but learning how to get to sleep is a very important human skill uh, that's going to affect your cognitive and personality development, your emotional control, and everything. Um, and also, for a parent, it's going to give you time to recharge, um, but a lot of parents will let their children stay up, and I, I hope I'm not indicting any of you. I apologize if I am, but you know, it starts early in life where people um, are afraid to make their child uh, sleep alone uh, in a crib. And parents will sometimes let the child crawl into bed with them. And my wife did this. She really did this. And it made it difficult for our child to get to sleep during the first year of his life. And when we finally took him away and put him in his own crib, he cried uh, like mad for two or three days. But after about the third day, he didn't cry when we put him in the crib. And if you enforce a bedtime, and just let it be non-negotiable. Yes, your child will be disappointed. But again, that's a time when you need to let them help them develop the ability to deal with disappointment. There are rules and there are ways in which we need to control our impulses. We all want to stay up late at night uh, watching movies and eating ice cream, but we can't. Um, and so this is one of those things when you can help your child develop some emotional control, but getting your child to sleep at night so they can get to 11 uh, to 13 hours a day is certainly uh, recommended. And again, a consistent best time is associated with more nightly sleep. You got to just make it. That's the way it is. I'm sorry, kid. That's just the way it is. Um, and it's, it's useful for your child. It's helpful and it's going to help them develop uh, better, have better time at school and again, the idea of developmental psychology is so that we can have a set of best tips to help us raise our children. I went to jail recently because she smothered two of her children by rolling them over on them when co-sleeping. Yeah, you know, and, and I hate to be judgmental. Um, my wife wanted to, to co-sleep with the children and I just I, I wouldn't let it happen. And we had to have some really serious fights on it. There are dangers of that for sure. Um, and, you know. Uh, I don't think the children sleep as well. Uh, I think it's it's sort of learning the habit of going to sleep. Uh, a lot of development, a lot of these skills that we take for granted, learning emotional control, learning how to go to sleep, uh, learning a sense of, of uh, confidence. These things don't develop uh, naturally. There is a certain amount of stimulation during critical periods that must be done in order for children to develop these healthy orientations not to be judgmental, okay? Um, that was very judgmental, but I don't know about any of you, and you decide what to, what works in your life. Um, now, sleep problems, lack of sleep in early childhood is associated with attention problems. Uh, so your kid's not going to, is going to have more difficulty paying attention in school. Uh, they're not going to, they're going to have worse school readiness. And one of the things that we believe, nobody knows for sure, but one of the things that we think about sleep is that during REM sleep, Mem memories and other learned behaviors are strengthened in your brain. So we think that REM sleep is actually associated with memory and intellectual functioning. When we sleep at night, um, actually the blood vessels in our brains uh, shrink a little bit. The ependymal cells around them shrink a little bit, and that allows fluid to rinse through your brain. And at night, uh, your cerebrospinal fluid, while you sleep, your cerebrospinal fluid actually washes the, uh, the, uh, the, the waste materials out of your brain. So sleep is very important for memory. Uh, people who don't sleep as well, of course, if you're having emotional problems because you didn't get a good night's sleep, uh, you're going to have poor peer acceptance in social skills. It's going to be harder to fit in when you're in a bad mood. Um, and not sleeping at night is just part of, uh, it's probably associated with a trio 
uh, or a, a selection of bad uh, activities that, that, that are not good for uh, uh, maintaining a healthy weight. So sleep problems are associated with uh, being overweight. Now, children need about 1,300 calories a day at this age. Not a ton of calories, you might say, Roni, but they're just little, little suckers at this point, right? So from three to six, they need about 1,300 calories a day. And you know what? Uh, if you feed your fed, uh, if you feed your kids some French fries or a cheeseburger from McDonald's, uh, you burned almost one third of their calories on some sort of wasteful food. So you're not giving them the protein that they need to grow. You're not giving them the vegetables and the vitamins and all that. What you're doing is you're giving them empty calories. Um, did you know that French fried potatoes are probably the most commonly consumed vegetable in the U.S. by children at this age? French fries, wow, not broccoli, not cucumbers or tomatoes, uh, uh, but French fries, and not even baked potatoes or regular potatoes, but filled with grease, right? Now, um, children who are overweight at five are four times more likely to be overweight at 14. I umpire a lot of baseball games, um, and I umpire children who are seven and eight years old, and it is sad to see how many children are actually overweight at eight years of age. You should not be over eight, overweight at eight years of age uh, as a general rule. But there are just so many kids I see on the baseball field. And by the time we're at 12 and 13, I'd say half my children uh, have, uh, you know, the kind of bellies we typically associate with being older. Um, and so Really, it's, it's all about this diet. And I know the world moves so fast, everybody has to hustle that it seems like fast food is the only option. And, but, you know, if you do that, you're putting a ton of calories without giving your kid what they, they do need. So it's, it's a all filler and no killer. And we don't want that. Now, children should be engaged in physical activity at least three hours a day. You know what? Back in the 1970s, before uh, video games were created and TV sucked, um, most kids probably got five, six, or seven hours of exercise a day. There was nothing to do inside, so we had to run outside and play kickball and tag and kick the can and hide and seek and war and fort and ride bicycles and skateboards. But then uh, computers were uh, became popular in video games. I remember when it, Atari uh, first came out, and suddenly video games were the thing. And now video games are so awesome. Um, and we all have cell phones and kids don't go outside and play. In fact, most of the play seems to be in organized team activities where there's a lot of pressure and negativity with these children. But really, kids should be outside running around in physical activity at least three hours a day. Is there any way you as a parent but, you know, actually, if we played today like the kids played back then, uh, parents would go to jail because in my day, it was completely fine to run outside and run three or four neighborhoods over um, and play with those kids. And my mom didn't have to know where I was. I think you'd probably go to jail for that these days, right? Um, but do you do all remember that, Rooney? When you were a kid, did your mom know where you were when you took off out the house? Uh, during the morning? Did your mom know exactly where you were? Maybe in your culture. Um, I don't know about you, Rosemary, but uh, in the 70s, man, it was just get out of the house on Saturday morning and uh, we would ride back by around lunchtime and maybe talk to my mom and then we'd ride back out and come back home at dark, you know? And uh, that was, that, it was kind of cool, but you would, <laughs> you couldn't do that now. Until dinner time, be home when the street lights come on. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. And so we would stay gone. Um, but you know, it's harder to do that because customs and morals in this country, in, in this world, won't allow you to do that. People's fears. Um, and people are so interested in their children de developing into some sort of college athlete uh, that everybody's focused on organized activities. Wouldn't it be cool if we could run around outside and play? Right, Bobby, so we could break back in. There you go. Great. That's what I'm talking about. That's that's fun, Rosemary. Right? All right, let's talk a little bit about language development. We were all over. Exactly, man. I remember us running down to the creek and just walking through the woods and just being gone, looking for snakes. 
Exactly right. I'll, I'll bet your culture was like that too, Renick. I figured. I figured you probably had more fun growing up too. You did all that that crazy wild adventure and stuff. Um, but uh, cooking at the river, right, right, the fun stuff. Well, yeah, we used to make little bonfires and whatnot and just have a great time, man. But okay, language development, early childhood. Now, the weird thing is, remember we told you that your child's going to speak their first word probably sometime after the first year. They're going to have this little language that explosion that happens during the second half of the second year. And what you're going to find is that when your child uh, gets to be uh, three years old, they're going to have a vocabulary that suggests that they learn somewhere between eight and 12 words a day. Children uh, engage in this thing we call fast mapping. They appear to learn words after only one presentation. If any of you ever took a foreign language class in high school, you know you did not learn 12 to 15 words a day in a language for five years straight. But you appear to do that as a kid. We refer to that concept as fast mapping. Nobody knows exactly why it happens. It's just the idea is, we seem to really, really suck up languages unless they were bad words, right? Then you learn them the first time. Good point, Rosemary. Very good point. Okay. So during preschool years, children are going to become more sensitive to the sounds of spoken words. If you remember, each and every one of you probably has a grandparent with a stupid name uh, because your little two-year-old ch child didn't know and didn't seem to care uh, how they were saying gaga or Dada, or Pee Pee, or whatever silly, stinking name you have for your grandparent is. Uh, but during the preschool years, children are finally going to become sensitive to the sounds of spoken words. They're going to be able to produce all the sounds of their language, uh, and they're actually going to be able to demonstrate a knowledge of morphology rules. Look at this really cool demonstration done by Jane Burko in 1958. If I told you this is a wug, now is there or another? Now there is another one. There are two of them. There are two, and what they found is even a three-year-old could say "wugs," and that suggests that that child understands morphological rules. "Ed" means it happened a while ago. "Ing" means it's happening continuously. "S" means there's more than one of. Children seem to ah. Uh, uh, have already understood the morphology of how you put words together to create a language. Remember, nobody taught them this stuff. They learned it inductively by hearing patterns among words and interacting with those words, right? They're going to use plurals, possessives, prepositions, articles, and verb forms. Dude, we have uh, politicians right here. They can use every part of the language. Remember, this is completely different from the child who at two years of age was using these two-word telegraphic sentences, more milk. Suddenly, the child's go, pour the milk slowly, mother, I am afraid. You know what I mean? Your child's going to use prepositions and adverbs and all of these, and they're going to demonstrate competence in these forms. Um, and they're going to learn and rule, apply the rules of syntax or grammar. They're going to know how to speak grammatically. Holy cow! Before your kid is six, they are speaking a language perfectly with all of these, well, based on a perfect use of what they've learned in their environment. So some people learn slang, but they're going to learn and apply the rules of syntax, uh, morphology, and all this vocabulary all by the time they're six. It's amazing to think about this because how many of you are struggling learning a language right now? I am. I'm trying to learn Spanish, and it's killing my 53-year-old mind, right? Now, children also during this age are going to develop a pragmatic ability. They're going to know how to take their turns. They're going to uh, know how to keep on topic, right? They're going to be able to talk about remote events and objects, things that happened yesterday, things that are going to happen tomorrow. And what I think is neat is they're going to have the ability to change their speech style. This means to say that your five-year-old is going to know that they need to talk slowly and simply to their two-year-old. Think about how deep that is. Not only has your child learned all the rules of a language, they understand that there is a developmental process. They already have that meta-knowledge. Meta they understand that others 
are at different roots and what that person, they have an intuitive understanding of what that person learning the language needs at that point. Think about that. Your child knows how to be a language teacher at the age of six. And so uh, these are all of the abilities. And this is amazing because it too, your child had a vocabulary of a couple hundred words and a couple of simple sentences, but suddenly they've become uh, uh, completely fluent in one, maybe two languages. Now, six principles in helping your child developing, uh, develop a good vocabulary. Children learn the words they hear most often. So if you're cussing up a blue storm around your household, guess what words your children are going to learn easily? Rosemary says they learn them after one time, but they will certainly learn them if you drop them three or four times, right? Uh, children are going to learn uh, things, learn the words for things and events that interest them. So you have to keep them interested and let them talk about the things they want to talk about, right? Uh, let your child guide themselves uh, guide the activities that you talk about. Uh, I saw a video of a young girl whose father is deaf and she stopped and signed to him that there was a baby crying in the aisle. Wow. Wow, that's kind of cool. See, notice the emotional, the, the empathy that's already there by the age of four. And what we're going to do is when we talk about this uh, next week, Nicole, we're going to talk about the development of empathy. It's not necessarily there uh, in two as it will be at the age of four. Great point, Nicole, right? So children learn the words they hear most often. They learn the words for things that are interest them. They are uh, learn the words better when they are interacting and playing and doing things. So it's cool to have lots of play partners for your friend. Don't be that person that only goes uh, th that, that, that is afraid to have play dates with your child, take them to the park, let them play with the other kids. Don't keep them away from the other kids. Let them mix it up, man. Right, Roni? Uh, the world's uh, tough. You got to learn how to mix it up with strangers early in your life. So uh, you need to, you know, be interactive with them and let them interact with other kids in groups of kids. Uh, this is important socially as well as for linguistic development. <clears throat> Now, um, it's best in contacts that are meaningful. So take your kid with you. Don't be the parent that leaves them at home. Carry your kid with you, with you and narrate to them and talk to them about the things you're doing, right? Uh, don't be afraid to uh, define things. Make sure your kid knows exactly what you're talking about. Sometimes children will let you keep talking even if they don't know what you're talking about. Don't hesitate and be aware that sometimes you need to clearly define things to them so they know exactly what you're talking about. And you know what? It would be cool if you tried to speak grammatically in front of your children. Okay. Um, uh, so, you know, if you want to help your child learn the difference between an adjective and an adverb, then you need to use your adjectives and adverbs properly. Right? Tense. Your, child are gonna, your children are going to learn whatever slang form that you are speaking to them in. They're, you know, they're going to learn a system of language. They don't necessarily have the ability to tell which one is the proper, per se, uh, uh, system of language, but they're going to learn whatever you present to them. So it's better when you try to use lots of words and use them grammatically correctly. Okay. Uh, child, do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, we are about running out of time. Child-centered kindergartens, Montessori's, and developmentally appropriate practices. All of these really uh, just focus in, in different ways on taking into account uh, what the child, where the child's, what we call zone of proximal development is. Where is the child interested in learning and what is the child's ability? And what we need to do as educators is to bring them into uh, into that zone where they are most engaged and where they are a little bit challenged. Now, this is based on the assumption that you think that somehow or another children need to start the race at four and five years of age. There are some people who say that really there is no need to push your child uh, into educational style preschools and kindergartens, and then all we are doing is creating stress on children. And then that, and some of these people argue that there is no difference in the educational outcomes on people who learn to read at six as opposed to people who learn to read at four. 
whatever. However, having said that, there are variations on how we educate uh, children uh, during when we first start the education, typically in kindergarten. Now, those of you may or may not know, uh, <laughs> uh, um, uh, right, I saw your, your comment, Ryan. I, I did, I'm sorry, I just saw it. It's, yeah, it's a little inappropriate, but it's funny. So I'm going to let it go. Uh, but here's the deal is um, there are some people who say that it's important to provide some sort of uh, nutritive educational content for your child. Now, uh, it is actually not mandatory to send your kid to uh, kindergarten. Compulsory education begins at six in first grade. Most people send their kids to kindergarten, but you actually do not have to start school until first grade. Uh, now, your educators are going to tell you that's a bad idea, blah, 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 blah. But honestly speaking, till your kid turns six, uh, they don't have to go to school. However, most people are pushing their kids into academic daycares in the attempt uh, to increase their children's academic performance. Yes. Um, uh, but, you know, in, in kindergarten is not supposed to be that academic. They're supposed to teach you your colors, your shapes, uh, your colors, your shapes, your letters, how to sit down, how to take turns, how to get in the line, how to be good citizens. Really, you know, there's no need to, uh, you know, uh, teach your kids too much academic stuff in kindergarten. You really need to socialize them so that they can become good learners. You need to learn how to learn. And that's really what preschool and kindergarten should be. But most of the people are trying to teach their kids Latin. You know what I mean? In, in kindergarten and preschool. And it's just, it gets a little bit uh, crazy at some point. Child-centered education, education of the whole world, and concern for his physical, cognitive, and social-emotional development. So some of these uh, child cares, they're uh, gonna focus on the academic stuff, but they're really gonna talk about, um, they're gonna try to, to educate the whole child, not just, you know, some daycares are just focusing on academic skills. Uh, some just focus on social skills, so they talk about focusing on the full picture. And the idea is that each child follows unique developmental patterns, so they try to hit each kid at their, quote, zone of proximal development. And, you know, uh, play is important. Uh, experimenting, exploring, restructuring. You know, the thing is, uh, play is a learning experience, and we need to focus a lot more on that and less on the rote learning uh, that we do, especially for our children at this particular age. You know what? I have completely run out of time. Uh, uh, read about the differences in these three approaches. And I do want you to know that uh, lack of stimulation as, as seen as a cause of poor academic performance and testing in schools. And the, Mont the Head Start program was developed in the 60s as a way of providing the needed stimulation that we know was important during this critical preschool period in order for children to be good students. Now, the problem is uh, Head Start seems to affect children's test schools as long as they're in the Head Start program. But as soon as they're out of the Head Start program and they go back to these non-stimulating environments, they tend to lose the gains that they uh, got. And so there are have been variations on the Head Start program where not only do they uh, uh, stimulate the kids, but they bring the parents in with them and, uh, and, and help the parent learn the skills so that they continue the proper stimulation even when the Head Start program uh, develops. So I want you to read about these on yourself. I am so sorry for running out of time. I probably spent too much time up on my, what is it, up on my, where, where is it? I know I have it, on my soapbox. I probably spent too much time today on my soapbox. I do apologize for that. Sometimes I preach a little bit. If I said that you shouldn't be doing something that you are doing, please feel free to ignore me. I am just one small uh, community college psychology professor talking about the things that he thinks he knows. All right. And in the end, it is up to you to raise your child the best that you know. All right. Anybody have any questions before I let you go? <laughs> Uh, any questions before I let you go? I want to thank everybody for coming today. Don't forget, we will be doing a uh, 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 webinar uh, tomorrow night um, at 6 p.m., and I hope to see everybody there. Um, if not, uh, do the discussion board. That will be due on Thursday. If I don't see you tomorrow night, I will see you Thursday morning. Uh, take care and have a great day. Bye. Mm -hmm.